So thank you very much, David. I'm very excited, moved to be here, to sit, to stand here and talk to you, Don. And I want to say first that the vagaries of time and some new insights it brings to my awareness. So it brings to me, you know, I'm to the time just to be connected to what Bruce said, have compelled me to add two short overtures to my talk today. I hope you will realize that all three parts of this paper are significantly connected and hence contribute to our ongoing understanding, uh, our growing understanding of time as such, of time in its own right. So here's the first overture. We celebrate today a life that is time, Don's gvurot, Don's heroic life. Uh, <laughs> and Don chose to set time right, to quote Hamlet, today along its various streams, forms, phenomenologies. Time, we all know, flows in one direction, no. Not sure about that. And all the time brings under its mantle inexorable changes, among which death is the gravest and most absolute. A little more than two months ago, David invited Yaron and myself to participate in this symposium. And both of us agreed with great joy. 20 days later, Yaron was gone. A friend and teacher of many in this room over a good number of years, he considered Don as his dearest friend, and I know, Don, that this was mutual. Yaron loved music and fathomed it deeply as a temporal art. We even wrote a book together which highlights musical time as a paradigm for democratic politics. But as a tribute to Don and Yaron's amity, I would like to add some thoughts on friendship and time and bind the three together, music, friendship, and time, in both their experiential and metaphysical aspects, with the help of some great thinkers, including Don and Yaron themselves. If you press me to tell why I love you, I feel that this cannot be expressed, except by answering, because it was he because it was I. Thus famously writes Michel de Montaigne, the 16th century French essayist, a Marano descendant whom Yaron so deeply adored. But what was the he in that he, and what was the I of that I, which enabled such love, such friendship? The question, of course, should be asked about any meaningful, long-term, loving relationship. To further per you, perplex you, or us, Yaron, at this point, would have perhaps quoted another famous essay by Montaigne, titled Of the Inconsistency of Our Actions, in which the philosopher writes about the, quote, supple variations and contradictions that are seen in us concluding that we are all patchwork and so shapeless and diverse in composition that each bit, each, to, each moment plays its own game." End of quote. In other words, today I am this person, tomorrow I'm a very different one. I can barely recognize myself. To this Montaigne further adds, there is as much difference between us and ourselves as there is between us and others. So, if this is the case, does the essence of the I and the she or he to which the philosopher refers in relationship to, in relation to friendship exist at all? And if not, what is the meaning of because it was he, because it was I? In between the lines, we may discern a hint of an answer. We must probe the insight, tells us the humanist Montaigne, and discover what springs set men in motion. An arduous and hazardous undertaking, he adds. So we have to look for springs, actually, a saw in French, or in simpler words, to understand what motivates people in the course of their becoming. 
This brings me to my second overture, to Don's encounters, the way you reasoned them in your masterfully written long epilogue you shared with us. Encounters, the way Don sees them, indeed, set indeed men in motion, men and women in motion. Encounters breed their own dynamics, one that holds the participant together, allows them to further transform individually and mutually while keeping them together, enabling continuity. Such an approach is music to my ear, and may, might be also down to use it, your ears, I don't know. Music is present in your text, not only in that beautiful Nina Simons, uh, Nina Simons episode that you bring up, but in the very prose, or maybe the poetics of it all. First, Don, you speak of rituals or encounters as form being formed. Formed within, from within rather than without. This is actually the very language employed by the famous 19th century music statistician Edward Hanslick, in German it's turn and bewegt and form, who professed the autonomy of musical unfolding. He and many who followed him insisted on the independence of music from meaning, mimesis, text. You hold a similar position vis a vis the social forms you have investigated a position uh, which you have developed into a methodology or, item, or better methodologies. Further down, you dwell on sequential form and on variations as the essence of encounter. Ancient Greek theoreticians regarded this as the fundamental trait of music cognition, which implies, and I quote, the simultaneous cognition of a permanent and a changing element. Finally, you speak of emergent forms that cannot be reduced to mere parts. Such phenomenology, a famous 19th century writer would rejoin, aspires to the condition of music. So we, are, we heard already about film and now what music can add to this picture. So much for overtures. And now to my promised contribution regarding Henri Bergson and Vladimir Yankelevich both ideas on time and musical time, which in more than one way keep up the venerable French tradition descending from Montaigne. It is, however, through Yankelevich, a direct disciple of Bergson, that I will read Bergson and then connect the former's subsequent ideas. So in 1931, Yankelevich, then 28 years old, dedicated his first book to his teacher's thought, which he later further revised. The author of Forgiveness, of Irony, and Death, three different books, and dozens of other works, Yankelevich was also an accomplished pianist and a learned musician whose writings on music and musicians culminated in his essay on music and the ineffable, published in 1961. Bergson's philosophy, Yankelevich states early in his book, is time regained, a paradise, if you, wash, if you wish, from which we were expelled by misguided philosophies and misleading scientific teachings that disrupted our understanding of body, soul, life, and freedom. Philosophers preferred static being over dynamic becoming, he complains, imposing the uniformity and divisibility of space on the heterogeneity and indivisibility of time. Time, or better duration, the Bergson dure real, the thing in the world which is most real does not tolerate definitive predicates, the French Jewish writer explained, a la Montaigne. And I recall here, here Ruth Katz, who is sitting here, happy formulation about music as sense perception without predication. What keeps the same consciousness from being one today, many tomorrow, he asks, in the name of Bergson. At each moment of its becoming, continues the disciple, consciousness thus presents us with a spectacle of a rich and varied identity, or as Schopenhauer says, of a Concordia disco. This last expression, let me add, comes from a millennia-long music theory discourse that regards harmonious resolutions as a momentary overcoming of dissonance on the way to the next. 
At the same token, Yankelevich suggests that the unity of a mind resembles that of a coral, ever breaking and ever resuming its flow between being and non-being. Expanding the musicological metaphors, Yankelevich suggests to see tonal universes as so many irreducible emotional worlds. Quote, only the miracle of modulation achieved the co-penetration of these incommunicable universes. End of quote. Throughout the large span of melodic continuity, characterizing a capriccio from Gabriel Fauré's Pièce Breve, you will perceive a dynamic that traverses discontinuities, tell, tells us Yankelevich. This is true, I add, even if you are not able to recognize such modulations technically. He dubs such flow as springing up of originalities, an impossibility notes if it had only static identity in its disposal. So I invite you now to attend to them for a moment. Listen to Forêt. Preacher from Pièce Breve. <laughs> Two minutes of music. Hmm? While you are trying, so maybe the other one will work? Okay. Hmm. No, that's not the end of it. So time was interrupted <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> it's not the end. Okay, this is a sort of silence I'm not going to speak, later I'm going to speak about silence, but that, that is not the kind of silence I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. So I suggest that you will listen to it later from the beginning to the end. So with the last insight, we have slid almost unnoticeably from duration in general to musical duration and back to life as lived, to time as experienced, which, like music, when closely attended, can disregard the conflict of contradictions, in Yankelevich's words. But still, there is difference between life and music. This becomes more apparent in Yankelevich's later treatise, La Musique et la Fable, mentioned above. Published in 1961, uh, that is 30 years after his book on Bergson, this text gives vent to the author's post-war resistance to anything German, to be, be it philosoph philosophical or musical. And I purposely use the term resistance since the author was an active member of the resistance since 1941. Music, he writes, but only such which distances itself from sonic seduction, alluring mythically uh, embodied in Ulysses' sirens, 
or Wagner's music dramas, is able to approach the ineffable, what Yankelevich deemed as the fertile inexplicability of life, freedom, and love. At this period of his life, his musical ideals were characterized by understatements and contraction, by pianissimo and delicate impressionism, highlighting what he called music's charm. The composers he adored were Faure and Ravel, Montpou, Millot and Martineau, Scriabin and Rimsky-Korsakov. <laughs> Not necessarily the avant-garde or the self-proclaimed revolutionists, but rather those whose music dissolved the limits fossilized by our mental habit of splitting and dividing. Those who imbue in us a state of infinite aporia that produces a fruitful perplexity. Music, he writes, like consciousness, with its subconscious anterior motives and its unconscious ulterior intentions, does not know the principle of contradiction. End of quote. Note that he does not directly equate music with consciousness. Rather, he suggests an analogy. Music like consciousness. This analogous relation is easily explained as a nonverbal mode of communication. It can absorb endless contrasts and divergences without ever contradicting itself. Please note that he speaks of consciousness, but not of emotions, of aporias, but not of affect. He left them all in the German and Italian music arenas, thus clearing the ground to, to readdress the question of time and music. For his discussion in this late art, uh, treatise, he distinguishes between two modes of time, the metaphysical or eschatological temporality, as he calls it, and an existential temporality divided itself into daily and stylized time. Metaphysical temporality is the oceanic immensity of endless time. That sort of duration is indifferent, unchanging, standing in contrast to existential time, which is fragile, superficial, and provisional, lived time. These two contrasting temporalities are nevertheless connected since the latter existential time quote, tends asymptotically towards nothingness, that is, towards oceanic blandness and silence. Musical time, conceived as stylized time, configured through certain tonal and rhythmic regularities, is related to both dimensions. In relation to the chaotic lived time, it is no more than a provisional suspension of that amorphous, uh, uh, disjoint time, the prosaic and tumultuous time of daily existence. However, once music has exhausted all possible combinations of sounds, it tends inexorably towards silence. Silence in, silence, in turn, points to the immensity of time, which is metaphysical. Thus, it is the aspiration to minimal expressivity in music, which takes us away, as he writes, from the talkative, the verbose, into the sustained, faintly solemn intonations of singing, instilling in us a different mode of being and becoming. Silence, indeed, determines music, at least the music esteemed by Yankelevich throughout, born of silence and pining away towards it. It highlights silence as an aspired and even, uh, and even within its own flow, hence its deep affinity with night, the eclipse of all visual sensations, the subduing of diurnal noise, if you sense here Schopenhauerian, Schopenhauerian vestiges and the Hegelian night of the world and even slight Wagnerian ar aroma, you are right. But for this agnostic Jewish thinker, it was Isaiah's language which mattered. The realization of that sort of immensity of time, of the arid desert of silence, in his words, should become 
if I understand him correctly, the soil from which the roses of morality should blossom, or those of the well-used conscience, to use Yaron's words that David, you quoted some time ago. Together with such roses sprout the lilies of love, friendship, and good work that we are celebrating today. Thank you. Yeah, Ruth. Thank you very much, Ruth. But it does have been mentioned also. What I had in mind about sense formation without dedication, of course, music can be possessed by music in kinds of different ways. But once connected, it states what it states. It's it. So the question is, whereby music is different than language. Through language you can talk about the water, the flowing continuous water. You can talk about all kinds of aspects. But they are, also, they are symbolic. Symbolic representation. But so is music, the symbolic representation. But the difference between music and language is vast. And therefore, music can be possessed. The other way around is more difficult. Well, there's a long thing that one can talk about, but that is a major point. And therefore, music has all these abilities, moods, ideas, and what have you, because it can be possessed. <coughs> Uh, it can be possessed and also depossessed later on. I mean, in a different context, some of these can be taken out if you are not part of that culture in which it is, uh, this was created. Uh, in, in that particular context in which it was uh, put together, then it can be freed again into something <coughs> which is different. Uh, and uh, the question is whether while it's going on, uh, the experience itself can detach itself from some of those meanings and <coughs> uh, something which is not symbolic. I think that these uh, uh, thinkers, like uh, both uh, that song as well as uh, Yankilevich, they try to think about it uh, in terms of indeed of the experience and, uh, and to, to get rid of some of those <coughs> meanings that were attached to that music and they Want, he, they wanted to, to get rid of it uh, because of all the cultural aspects that were connected to it. And even to get rid of that music that was more possessed than the other music. That's why I rejected German music.